Jacqueline, thank you. <laughs> you made me laugh. Um, it's so nice to see um, so many, so many familiar faces. Hello, um, everyone looks healthy and well. I hope you really all are. And um, thanks, Jacqueline. And also, um, personally, I also knew Rifka. So, um, you know, it's a real uh, honor to be able to dedicate it in, in um, our learning in her zuchus and in, in her merit, her neshamash to have an aliyah. So um, I just want to say that I really um, do not enjoy these Zoom things and doing this on Zoom. So first of all, please God, um, my Wi-Fi should be okay. Um, and I, I hope it all goes, you know, goes smoothly. So, um, Simcha. So first of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about Camp Simcha and the amazing organization that I, I work in um, that you've probably all heard about. And yes, we did just have this huge charity, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my role and what, and what we do and then um, lead into, into Simcha, into the idea of Simcha. So, um, and I'm happy to take questions at the, at the end. Um, so um, Camp Simcha was founded 25 years ago. It's 25 years old, actually. Um, it, uh, last week, it was 25 years old, which is very exciting. I've been working on the organization for the last 10 years. Um, thanks, actually, to Joanne Woolwich, who's a former uh, Bushy member. As many of you know her, she, she recommended me and got me the job. So I have tremendous gratitude to her for that. Um, and um, it's funny because it's called Camp Simcha, but it's, um, it's not a camp, right? It's not a camp, um, even though people assume it is a camp. The name actually is a little bit, it gives it... Um, doesn't explain properly what it what it is. And the reason why it's called Camp Simcha is because 25 years ago, when um, it was founded by Mayor and Racheli Plancy, and when um, they decided to fight Fat to um, they they started the organization and they um, they wanted to call it they were a, a, an umbrella, if you like, they wanted to be an umbrella under high lifeline which um, deals with cancer patients in the USA. But that was just when Chai was, um, fine, um, was being founded here in the UK. So they couldn't call it Chai. Um, and as we know, we have the organization Chai that we work together very closely with. But um, we, um, they decided to call it Camp Simcha, which is one of the summer camps that that runs under the umbrella of High Lifeline in the USA, where actually we send lots of our lots of our um, children to in the summer. Well, we did send them when it wasn't COVID. Um, um, so, um, what do we do in Camp Simcha? We deal actually with quite a few um, different sectors. So, first of all, we deal with what we have and um, what we call as regular which are um, our cancer children. So we deal from the zero to 18 year olds. So regular, which is um, children who have um, any form of cancer. Um, another thing that we deal with is what we call special, which are children with um, any serious lifelong childhood illness. So it could be a genetic illness, something they were born with, something they developed, something that is a serious um, childhood illness. We also have a section that we deal with. Um, we've got a Premi Baby project where we deal with lots of uh, Premi babies, which unfortunately is quite prevalent now in COVID. We're seeing quite a huge, um, quite a huge increase in our Premi Baby department. And we also deal now, we've just piloted it for the last year and thank God um, it's been quite successful and we're going to be taking this on, um, is children with mental health. Um, um, issues and it's we've got quite a lot of, of um, I can't think of the word now things that you you criteria that have to be met but um, is is also that so there's those four different things that we deal with and we also um, are able to offer support to Crohn's epilepsy and diabetes children undergoing these um, um, who have these conditions so um, my role is I'm called uh, FLO, which stands for an FLO, which is a family liaison officer. Now, there are 11 of us FLOs 
And um, my job really is to service the family in the best way possible and um, to really tailor make the package for our families. So um, they're, they're, like I said, there are 11 of us. Um, I service about 15 different families with all, I have regular families and special families and premier baby families. And um, I, um, I work with a team. So there's us FLOs and there's also a services department, a fundraising department, a PR department. And what happens is um, us FLOs are really, um, if you like, we're on the ground running with the families. So we will speak to the different departments and try and get things in place to, to ease something within the family. So we offer a range of support from um, cabs to get to the different hospitals, different appointments, um, food, big brothers, big sisters, some of your, your children, I, I can see um, um, you know who you are, have, have your, your kids have actually been our big brother and big sisters, being able to provide that um, support for either the child themselves or a sibling in the family. Um, we can offer art therapy, we can offer um, support for the parents, lots of different things like that. But what I really want to give you a taste of um, just in this part of the talk is, is how we can tailor make, if you like, the package to our family. So I want to um, go back quite a few years for myself where I had a three-year-old, a little three-year-old girl who was diagnosed with um, ALL, which is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is basically childhood leukemia. And um, she was a three-year-old, just started nursery. You know, mum was going back to work at the time. And um, she was unfortunately diagnosed with ALL. Thank God, by the way, this story does have a happy ending. They don't all have a happy ending, but this one does. And thank God the girl is now um, out of remission and she's doing really, really well. And we're quite, quite, uh, quite a few years on. But during this time, this um, child had just started nursery and she had to be really pulled out of nursery to undergo this uh, grueling chemotherapy that she had to go through very, very disturbing, obviously, for her whole family and, and for herself as a little three year old. And what happened um, um, was she, you know, she couldn't really go back into nursery because of risk of her catching infection. And then she'd, she'd be exposed to all sorts of things. And then she wouldn't be able to have the next treatment. And there's a whole cycle that that um, children have to have to go through. And um, she had this dream, this little girl, one dream that she wanted a princess to put her to bed one night. That was all she wanted and she, all she kept on talking about. And, you know, a typical, I guess, three-year-old little, little girl's like fairy dream. And um, so um, I developed really quite a nice rapport and a good relationship with the mum. And um, we decided that, please God, she should make it to her four-year-old, her fourth birthday, and she should be healthy and well. And I said to mum, you know what, leave it to me. Let's, let's see what we can do. So um, thank God she did. She, she, she was able to have a four-year-old birthday party, and she wasn't able to have her three-year-old one at the time because it was just as she was being diagnosed and everything, and she was really quite poorly. And by the time she was four, she was doing much, much better. And um, we, we arranged for a carriage to come, horse-drawn, with a fairy. We, we went to one of these companies that we managed to source with like this princess fairy person dressed up and the girl didn't know anything about it. Now I was at the party and we, you know, we bought this nice cake and everything else. And at the end of the party, we told the girl to come outside and I, it, you know, you know, when you talk about something that's priceless to see this, this joy, this true, true simcha in this little four-year-old's face was, it's, it, it was indescribable. She sees this horse-drawn carriage and she sees this princess come out of this carriage and go up to her and say her name and invite her in. And then this princess gives her a ride home in the carriage, which was the hall was about, you know, eight minute ride away with the, in the carriage. And then the princess comes out the carriage and says, would you like me to tell you a bedtime story? And lo and behold, she puts 
this little girl to bed with this story and we have pictures and everything. I actually think it, it, it must have been about seven years ago now. I think it was even in the JC, we, you know, the PR department got hold of it. And obviously it made a really good story. But the point is that um, what it brought to this child was unbelievable and not only to her but to her parents and to her mother to see that she actually was able we were able to put this dream in place and something never to be forgotten and um, thank god like I said that has that had a, a happy a happy ending but not all the things we do are so bling flash kind of if you like like that um, another example you know I think I had a 16 year old boy going through um, also cancer at the time um, and various other ailments uh, due to it. And um, he was desperate to do work experience with Ted Baker. That was his big thing. And he, he hadn't made it with all his GCSEs and everything. And he was off school quite a lot. And we were able to, to get this Ted Baker contact and to get him having his work experience. And again, it just built him up in such a way and, and made such a difference. Um, and then there are things that are less glam, you know, like making sure that when a child um, comes out of whatever operation they're having, possibly in Great Ormond Street, that we can, I can send up a huge thing of balloons with their specific character or what they like, or send in a magician or something like that. Now, obviously, because of COVID, um, things like this have been um, much less possible but it's still possible to send things in and get things going. And sometimes it's something so small, like knowing that one of my mums or dads is in Great Ormond Street or in St. Mary's or, or whatever kind of hospital they're in. And um, I know they, 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 they haven't eaten lunch and just turning up with that iced coffee and a salad just for them and giving them that chat for five minutes or an hour, whatever it is that they need and just providing that and creating that opportunity for them and being able to give them that little bit of, of something to minimize what they're going through. It doesn't take anything away. It's impossible to take it away, right? We all wish we had a magic wand and we could just take away all our problems and all our troubles and everything. But it's just adding a different dimension of simcha and, and creating that for them. So now I want to move to like the next part of um, talking to you really about, about Simcha. And um, look, I'm really fortunate in that um, this job, this one of my jobs of working, being an FLO in Camp Simcha is that I can do this. I can, I, I have the, the, the tools and the services and work with an amazing team of people that we can create these opportunities for Simcha. And I kind of see it like it's like these pockets of happiness where you have light streaming through for a brief moment to, like I said before, minimize the pain. And I was thinking like, we are now in the month of Adar, right? And we're told in this month of Adar where we've just had Purim, we're like just over halfway through the month of Adar, we're meant to um, increase our simcha, increase our happiness. And, you know, I feel like, how? How do we do this? Yeah, happiness isn't like this. It's like this tap, right? Like, you know, that saying money grows on trees, like you can just switch on the happiness tap and it comes, right? We've all had bad days. We've all had days, times, periods in our life where we're disappointed, where we're upset, where we're going through something really, really, we feel we just can't manage it. And you can't just create that happiness. You can't just make it happen, feel it. It just doesn't work like that. Switch it on. And often what I see through our our my camp Simcha families, I guess, is that they feel at times that they're not abandoned, they're not alone, they're just, that they feel that there is someone or something, not necessarily me, they're holding them through this, going through this with them so that they are not alone, that they do have somewhere to turn to, something to ask from, through, through the organization, through Camp Simcha. And I was thinking about the per in the Purim story, there are no open miracles, right? It's not like Pesach, we have Pesach and, and the, the system of the Red Sea, right? That was, was like a huge, huge open miracle, right? Hanukkah, where, um, can you still hear me? 
I'm seeing that it's saying my internet connect. Yeah, you can still hear me. Okay, great. Hanukkah, mm -hmm. where we have, um, we have that little bit of oil that's left, that little jug of oil, right? And it was a huge miracle. It lasted for eight days. The Purim story was very, very difficult, uh, different. The Purim story wasn't like that. In the Purim story, you have these events that keep on happening that you can see are, have been carefully planned. They've been orchestrated by, by God alone, right? And it's like God was there all along, taking care of us and bringing us back to him and not abandoning us. And even when we thought we were going to be abandoned, that last, last moment, it all switched on its head and it was all different. And there's a bigger plan out there. And, and I guess, you know, it, it's very difficult and not everyone feels this and not everyone taps into this. But to understand that there is a bigger plan out there and that in itself can bring a sense of inner calmness, inner peace, which, which can create happiness within, within itself. Now, this, this doesn't work for everyone. For some people, it does work. And um, something else which I often see, and I, I like to call it, um, we can get caught up in this cycle of what we say um, conditional happiness, right? Conditional happiness. So what is that? I don't know if you've ever thought this, but you know, I, I've been in places and, and times and whatever, when I think to myself, you know what, if I just had that pair of boots, if I just had that pair of boots, I'd look so great. I'd feel so good. It's going to really, really add to my life. And it might in, in some way, and it's important to feel good and, and to feel that happiness, but that isn't going to create, it's not going to stop there. You know, if I just got that promotion, if I just moved to that bigger house right if my kid would just do this if my spouse would just do that if I could just da, 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 and it goes on and on and on and there's no ending right and what happens when that doesn't happen right what happens when either that doesn't happen or when I get that and I get what I really wanted and then the next thing and the next thing and you know in ethics of the fathers we're told who 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 is really considered a wealthy person someone who is happy with his lot, who is happy with what, with what he, he or she has. And that's really about being happy in the now, now with what I have right now. And I saw this, this, um, I saw this quote, right? Happiness um, isn't a happening, it's an attitude. Happiness isn't a happening, it's an attitude. And I was thinking, you know, there are so many people that I meet that have have really their lives are really unpleasant really unpleasant it can be from a financial point of view from an illness point of view from losing someone so close to them from god forbid we should never know losing a child something like that yet what i see is that these people who one would think right there's no hope there's utter despair they are choosing to be happy at times. They are choosing to have a positive outlook. I've been in hospitals with, um, with some people where they will find humor in the situation where their child can be next door undergoing the most grueling treatment or next to them, and yet they'll make a joke to the doctor or to the nurse. And it is the most unbelievably humbling experience when you see someone choose to make that choice beyond humbling right that they've 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 found that glimmer of hope they found something to smile about something to joke about and as we know right laughter is the best medicine smiling is contagious I smile I can see a few of you smiling right that's what happens that is exactly what happens and um you can try it you know you I'm often I, I go up to cannons for a jog or walking around and you say good morning to someone and you smile and majority of people will smile back or they'll have a delayed reaction and they'll say it afterwards because that's what happens. That's the power that us humans have. And, and this positive attitude and being able to find that positivity when, when everything seems lost and there's no hope is, is really unbelievable. And not looking on at the past, what should have, what could have, if I would have done this, if I would have, et cetera, et cetera. To live without regret, to focus on today. 
And it is part of a mindset and it's part of conscientiously making it happen that again, we, we, we all have the control, we all have the power to do. Um, another thing um, is, and I'm sure you guys have heard about this and this is really the buzz also, you know, lately to be grateful, right? Gratitude, to find the things to, to, to be thankful for. And um, when we start to recognize the small things and give thanks, then this whole positivity kind of opens up on you. It's much easier to look for the good and to be positive. And I was on a share the other last week with um, an amazing lady in Jerusalem called Sarah Yechaved Rigla. Um, really, really unbelievable. Jacqueline, I don't know if you were on that share, but she... Um, she said it, it was a bit of a um, it was more like a workshop right and she said I want you all now to start um, we're not going to do this by the way I'm just telling you what she what she said and um, she said there were over 100 people on this zoom and she said I want you all to start putting in the chat things um, to do with our body that we have to be grateful for but she said, you're not allowed to just put my hands because they can hold things. She said, I want you to be detailed and specific. And it was unbelievable. And she literally read it through. And people were saying things like your, um, your I, I, I'm really bad with my pronunciation of things, your um, urethia within your kidney because, or next to your kidney because of what it does. Your eyelashes specifically for the iris of your pupil that your inner ear canal because of how it connects and what and and the kind of hearing that you can have when your inner ear canal is and people were being really really specific and you kind of took a step back and it was like oh my gosh like we don't even realize all these things that are happening now even as I'm talking to you within our bodies and it actually made me think back to um it made me think back to something I lost my father when I was um in my early early 20s and um he was very very sick and I remember being in the hospital and I remember um slowly just seeing how his body was packing up and as most of you uh, probably know, we, we have the blessing of Asha Yatsa of, um, that we say after we've been to the bathroom, after we've been excused. And I remember um, saying that blessing um, there coming out of, of the bathroom right next to his hospital room and saying it with such intent, such kavana, because all I was witnessing in front of me was my father his body literally slowly everything stopping to work and understanding that I was in a position where my body thank God was fine and it was working amazingly and healthily and please God up until 120 it should continue to do so and being so grateful for every single thing there that it was such a lesson to me to say it with such intent and taking on in my head you know what please God um, um, I should be able to do this and always have that that intent that I had then to do it because when you see that something isn't working right and isn't going okay then you've got even more reason to be grateful for it but this is even different what what we're talking about now because this is about making a conscientious decision when things are going okay to be super grateful for everything that's going okay and to, to really think about all those intrinsic details of everything that's behind it. And, you know, I always think about this. I work with a lot of kids who have um, literacy or dyslexia difficulties and it's unbelievable. We've all got a working memory, right? Everyone's got a working memory. Some people's working memory is, is, is weaker than others. And what I see with a lot of the children that I work with is that there's a certain part of the working memory that just is not strong. It's not strong. And that's why there are so many um, um, difficulties and challenges that are presenting themselves with these children in the classroom and learning to read, to write, to spell, not necessarily all three, it could be one specific one. And you realize, oh my gosh, the detail that God made it, that within our working memory, you have your short-term memory and your long-term memory and the bit that needs to bridge over and the rapid naming bit and all these different things I only know about just because I've been fortunate enough to, to study it and to learn it. 
And you just think, oh my gosh, that detail is unbelievable. And again, it's something else to just be super, super grateful for when, when some of us by osmosis can just learn that and take it on, you know? I always think it's amazing. You look at children in the classroom and there are those kids that we say by osmosis, it means they're just gonna be able to get it. They're just gonna be able to pick it up. They'll pick up their letters and their numbers and everything else and their language. And then there are those kids that they're not gonna be able to get it by osmosis. And they're not going to be able to just pick it up like that. And they need a different level of, of working through to be able to get them to get to wherever they are able to get to. And again, it, it, it's just so amazing. It's fascinating to, to, to see that. Sorry, I feel like I've gone a little bit off, off tangent there, but bringing it all together. So, um, so gratitude. So um, when we have this gratitude, it causes us to feel blessed. And when we feel blessed, it creates an element of simcha, an element of happiness that we can be able to tap into. And, um, you know, the Maimonides, um, Maimonides um, talks about the following. He says that there is no more glorified form of simcha, of happiness, than to cheer up the hearts of, he says, three, three kinds of people, orphans, orphans, widows, widows. Um, and converts and to cheer cheer up those people who are less fortunate individuals than yourselves and that he says is to be compared to god himself right so really then what we're saying is what he's saying is he's 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 taking people that are maybe less fortunate than than ourselves and when we can give and cheer up those people that in itself is going to create, first of all, that's, that's on par with, with God himself, right? The ability of what God's able to do. But that in itself creates a sense of happiness for people. And, you know, I've seen time and time again, I'm just fortunate because of the jobs that I've got, right? That I'm in these opportunities where I can give to people. And I always think, by the way, it's important to say this, that, you know, obviously there are boundaries and giving should not be at an expense of one's family or those nearest and dearest to, to them. There's a very fine line and there's, and there's a boundary that shouldn't be overstepped. But when, when a person is able to give to someone else, ultimately it makes you feel good for being the giver, right? There's an amazing organization and there's gift that you're probably aware of. There's um, something we also have called Shabbat walk, right? And I know that my kids are very involved in this Shabbat walk. So they will go on Shabbat afternoon and they'll take out maybe a kid with special needs, maybe help out a mum who's got a bunch of little kids under a certain age. And they'll go and they'll pack things up for people. They'll deliver things to people. And, and they are in this role of giving. And ultimately though, what's it doing? it's building them up, but it's more than that. It's making them feel good about themselves, right? And when any of us feel good about themselves, well, naturally, a consequence of that is that we're gonna feel happy, right? You need to feel good about yourself because ultimately you wanna, you wanna feel happy, which is super, super important. So as a consequence of giving, as a consequence of making others feel happy what we are doing is we are creating that joy in our own lives and to be able to create that joy in our own lives is the two go intertwined so the title of this was was finding joy in our lives and bringing joy to others there's a there's there's a bridge between the two right in order to find joy within within our lives let's 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 um, recap we have to feel first of all that we're not alone that we're not abandoned that there's always someone there right walking you know I'm sure so, um, you're familiar with the footprints poem right and that was all there when you know things got too too much for us in our lives that that there was only one set of footprints and that was where God's God carried you right so first of all if we have friends or family that often feel that that they are alone they are being abandoned for us as people to be able to be there but to know that ultimately you know, Hashem didn't just leave us in the Purim story or anywhere for that matter. He always made sure to bring about <clears throat> that, that outcome and please God that we will have that also within this 
crazy world that we're going through right now and all the craziness that's happening. Um, and the other thing that, that we spoke about was that happiness isn't a happening, it's an attitude, but it's up to us. We have that choice to create the attitude, to make that happen, to look for the good. And like I said to you guys, you know, being around people that, that have pure despair and, and terrible things going on around them and that they are able in their terrible times to find that happiness and that positivity um, is, is a really truly humbling um, experience. And, and, and also to, to be grateful. When we can be grateful and give gratitude and recognize that, then that causes us to feel the best, which in turn is going to make us feel, feel good, create that element of simcha. And as a consequence of giving and finding that, to be able to give to others and finding that joy in, in, in what's going on around us, we are then able in turn to create that joy and, and have that within. Does that, does that make sense? Everyone with me? I can't see you, I can only see my face, which is really quite daunting to be perfectly honest with you. But um, um, <laughs> um, anyone wanna ask anything? Daniel, how do you get people to come forward to, to, to take sort of part in, in, in benefit from, from Camp Simcha? I know when we had a problem, maybe maybe because John was older or whatever, we didn't feel we didn't feel we were needy enough. How do you make people realize that there's nothing, you know, that there's not a problem to take benefit from that? Um, right. Okay, that's a really good question. Because we will, um, we, so we have a whole referral system that often will either get referrals through um, through the hospital or um, Jan Woolwich is is a, an outreach person and she's made amazing connections. Um, sometimes we'll get a phone call from someone. Um, we won't ever be able to pick up the phone for loads of confidential and you know sure. data, all this kind of thing. Um, it's really hard. Amanda, it's, it's, it's really, really hard. It's, it's either it, it reaches breaking point and, and sometimes people realize, oh my gosh, like we, we need help. Um, and often it's um, sometimes a pride thing also. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we don't fit into that category and whatever. And that's, you know, everyone's on their own personal journey. Everyone's on their own personal journey and no one can, can force anyone to do anything, but I always feel, and that's why I, I feel like I want to, I, 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 it's so important to say that it's a tailor-made package and mm -hmm. it's very, very confidential also, you know, everything is confidential um, because there's no right or wrong how much to give, how less to give. I've had families that They've been givers their whole lives, right? That's the only thing they know. And for them to have had to have come to Camp Simcha, they hated it. The parents mm -hmm. hated it, but they saw what it gave to the child and the sibling. And because of that, they were able to do it. You know, we just had, um, we normally have retreats, family retreats where we take away families. So obviously that's been impossible now, but last weekend we had a virtual retreat. And I always say to my families, you can, you can come to as much as you want to come or you can come to as little as you want to come. And we've been away with families before where the parents have literally stayed to themselves. They haven't come to any of the parent talks. We've, we've, sometimes we fly over amazing people from High Lifeline in America or people here, real inspiration, people that can really give, give amazing tools and, and power um, um, to our parents. But they can't take it. But then the kids will join as much as, as, as they want to. But you can't, no one can ever make anyone do anything. It's got to come from, from within. I also just say what an amazing organization, friends of ours, people, somebody that Paul's very close to, who's, whose son's been unwell with cancer, who um, the stuff that we've seen that Camp Simple have done for them is just phenomenal. And it's made such a difference for them. Uh, for the child, for the whole family. So should, yeah, should come for that. Just yeah, no, really, I totally overwhelmed with it. It's just amazing. I, I always say I, I feel like I've I've I mean I've got the worst job, but I've got the best job. I wish that I wouldn't need to have the job I have. Yeah. I wish with all my heart, and please God, soon it will come to an end, and no one should ever need it. But if people do need it, I feel like I'm so lucky, I'm so fortunate to have this job. I really am. 
thanks to Joanne Willich. I'll say it again. <laughs> <You're really grateful. laughs> well, thank you to your team. They're amazing, really, the stuff you put on. What I, what I also think about Kansimha is, is the fact that they reach out to all of the siblings. If, if um, there is a child who is unwell and the siblings are also looked after as well, so they're not pushed to the side because the priority of the parents is on the child that's unwell. So the other part of Kansimha is that, that it, like you say, is that it is targeting all the rest of the family, but specifically the siblings too, which I think is so, so important. Yeah, absolutely. The siblings often will get left behind um, um, often and, and will suffer. So yeah, it's a, it's a whole package, if you like, it's true. And Rena, both, both your, your, all your kids and your son-in-law, huge, major uh, Camp Simcha, big brothers and big sister, for sure. And, and the fact as well is that you're reaching people all over the country. Because, I mean, you just mentioned about Elise, but Elise being at university was able to help. I mean, she'd hate me to say, but uh, able to help uh, somebody in the Birmingham area, which I think is amazing because it could help her help someone. But also that the, the organisation reaches out in, all over the country as well. It's, we think of London and Manchester uh, as the areas that, that are, are most populated by us. But there are people and you and you do um, have uh, reach out or outreach to all over the country, which, again, is, is something that maybe is not public. Yeah, no, absolutely. We have families all over, all over England and Norwich, Manchester, all over, all over. Um, and also what's really important to say is it's not a religious organization. People often think that, and especially because of the name, but it's not just a religious um, organization. We've got lots of families who are, you know, from all over. It's, it's not, we don't just target religious families. Daniela, you touched on um, this last year, which obviously for everyone has been really challenging, but I'm assuming, especially for you know, I, we've had conversations with people where the, the parents have to decide which parent can go with the child or if a parent can even go with the child. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what sort of things Camp Simpler has been able to do, um, even though things are so challenging right now? Like what has been sure. successful that they've, that they've been able to do? Um, so it's really true, first of all, what you say, you know, for, for any family, especially with a kid going through treatment where they have to choose which parent to go with. And not only that, but to know that the parent has to stay there, the hospitals weren't allowing, like sometimes you could then, you know, the parent could come home and alleviate the other, but no, it had to be for three days to do with picking up anything. And, and it was it was real hell what was going on. So um, it's it's really quite amazing actually what, what we've been able to do. Um, we, we, so we set up a, um, a parent website actually where parents had a password and they could come in to the website and they could order loads of different resources that would literally get sent out to them within 24 hours um, art resources music resources and um, books dvds cds like you name it it was on the website then we had obviously we can't we weren't allowed to our volunteers weren't allowed to go into people's homes right I wasn't allowed to go into anyone's home I wasn't even allowed to go into the hospital like I normally would I couldn't even go outside the hospital like I normally would and um, so we were able to send things we were able to send things backwards and forwards we were able to do over zoom um, unbelievable things we have these amazing um, art groups that we set up where we would um, parents would sign up their kids and we would set them not only for the child themselves like what Rena was just saying for the for the siblings also split into age appropriate um, you know appropriate ages and we would send out the art box prior to the session and then one of our art teachers would be on a session with the zoom doing whatever it was step-by-step -step instructions and if I tell you the creativity, the most amazing things, but we didn't only do it for our siblings, we did it for parents. We had these incredible mirrors that, um, that parents were making. There was a mirror and then using old magazines coming out, the creativity behind it was unbelievable. We had these gin testing things for some of our dads that were more inclined to that. 
we have had, um, I mean, I've gone and, and we've just, us as FLOs met maybe a mum for a coffee, taken something over, um, sent, you know, whether it was a nice bouquet of flowers or, or something specific to get that mum through what she needed to. I had recently um, family in the hospital for three days and um, thank God I knew exactly what this family liked and especially what this little kid liked who um, he can't talk and stuff. He has a tracheotomy and things are very difficult. And we sent in for the mum and I sent in this whole... Um, it was a snug blanket the, the hospital weren't providing a bed for her to sleep on. So we also managed to get a mattress, managed to get a mattress up there to Great Ormond Street. One of these snug blanket things, um, one of these, um, you know, the art coloring books, it's very calming, just like a whole package that we created and sent up there. She couldn't believe it. And then we were able to take care of what was going on. This mum would normally cook in advance and put it all in the freezer for the sibling at home and the dad, but we were able to, to send in all the food. So she just didn't, she didn't need to have that on her head. It was taken care of, you know, um, which made such a huge difference. And like I said, our virtual retreat, I cannot believe that um, we were able to pull this off last weekend. If I tell you, we had literally from Thursday night through to Sunday, 12 o'clock, which it ended with family bingo. We, we, you know, for our families, this was everything. They did not need to buy anything for the weekend, not a magazine, not a newspaper, not even, um, um, we, we sent in really nice paper goods, all meals catered over Shabbat. Plus Thursday night we had, um, can't remember his name now he's a famous psychotherapist from America talking to our parents just specifically for the parents about these challenging times COVID what it's like for a camp Simcha family in these COVID times right and we sent in also um, I don't know if you guys have seen the Bartonura wine cans that with a few nibbles and the Chaim glasses so that they could have their nibbles and whatever as the guy was talking over Zoom, which normally we would have like a whole thing if they would have been on retreat for the parents. And then there were huge boxes delivered where the families were told only when they were allowed to open them. So on Thursday, while the parents were, were doing that at different times, there was a magic show for the younger kids there was um I can't even remember what it was so oh, an escape room for the older boys for the older girls there was more of like a painting thing going on right then um Friday was much more of a chilled day but we had sent in normally we would put on um like the girls to have their hair done the guys can go and do paintballing all things like that so we had sent in specific things for the girls to still carry on and and do this then there was a friday night meal there was a beautiful kiddish with herring and everything else that was sent in then there was shabbat lunch then there was um snacks in the afternoon and games to keep new brand new games to keep the kids occupied so you know if parents wanted to rest go off do their own thing whatever they wanted then saturday night we sent in pizza and chips or fish and chips and we had a whole virtual concert over zoom and at different points, they were told to open different envelopes and take out different um, toys. And we had a magician come on. And then what we always have is a special talent show on our retreats. And this really gives a time for the kids to shine and the siblings. So we had pre-recorded it. They had sent in, our parents had, my families had sent in like little videos and we, um, you know, collated it all together and they watched it. And then Sunday morning, every family got delivered brunch in between like 10 and 11. And then we had a huge family bingo before we said goodbye. And, you know, the comments that came, it was still, I think the beauty of Camp Simcha is that you feel like you're part of a family. You belong to one big family and that's what's what really came out so that's just you know i never in my wildest of dreams would have imagined that we would have been able to pull off this virtual retreat families were laughing that these huge big boxes were coming to their doors i went to deliver some to some of my families that i hadn't seen 
for ages. And the fact that I was just able to deliver these boxes to their doors, they're just the, the, the tears out of happiness and for seeing that familiar face and knowing that even though we can't do our usual retreat, which is so important, let's do it virtually, let's try. And um, we pulled it off, it was amazing. So it's, it's trying to do these things in a virtual way. Thank God we have Zoom, thank God we have computers, right? Um, and look, bring on that lockdown to, to, to finish because to be able to, even one of my mums who is really stuck at home a lot and she's waiting for her kid to be able to go back to the special school that he's in. And she keeps on saying to me, Danielle, I can't wait. We're, we're, we're just, we're going to walk. We're going to walk. Like, you know, we'll get a nice coffee and we'll just walk and just chat and just be there so that that sense of abandonment and loneliness isn't so prevalent. And I think that to an extent, we've still been able to, to create that and do that. Really amazing. Thank you, Daniela. And I think for me, one of the most incredible things must be um, if you ever want to give an example of how fortunate we are to be part of this amazing Jewish community, must be you, you touched on that charity campaign how before you blinked there was so much money raised obviously it shows how much everyone loves the work that Camp Simcha does but I just felt so proud to be part of the Jewish people um, and I'm sure for you to be part of an organization where you, you just couldn't catch your breath it was just like the campaign had hardly launched and it was just unbelievable to watch tell us how how that felt so um it, it was it was incredible you know you, we normally put on a dinner right we normally put on a dinner um every two years and the proceeds from that dinner really are, are what stretch us through to be able to do all the different things and obviously once covid hit you know all the regular appeals the Pesach appeal, the Rosh Hashanah appeal, they just, it, it was different. People were not able to give the usual don't, it, like it, it was really, really challenging. And then all with the charities and, and everything else, what, what, what kept on happening, they were thinking about it and they managed, I mean, it was incredible. Look, you know, people here are sick, sick kids and they will often give, but, but to the extent of what actually happened, no one could fathom. And I think what was so amazing was that normally a dinner um it's only a certain kind of person that will go or you know if you're able to go or whatever else but this was totally inclusive you could give two pounds it didn't matter what you could give but everyone felt a part of it and you should all just know that that the the money raised from that we don't know next when we're ever going to be able to fundraise right no one knows what and to be honest with you personally i think a dinner is maybe a thing of the past also i'm not so sure people are going to be running back to dinners so quickly and i'm not so sure that people are going to be interested in having that outlay of doing that either but that people could be part of it and the fact that the the funds raised it's kind of that sense of wow we're really going to be able to service our families again. Like this retreat that we just pulled off, yeah? Even though you don't have the expense maybe of the hotel that you would usually do or whatever else, the other expenses involved were so huge, such a colossal amount that it, it's such a relief to know that you can do that. And it's such a relief to know that we can do all the other things and we can have our Keshet camp in the summer and in whatever way, shape or form that that can, that can take place and to still be able to provide the therapies. And something I forgot to mention, by the way, is also, is it, I think it's really important to say, is that we work together with lots of other organizations. So I personally will work together with the um, family supporters, um, support people in, in Chai, right? And in Noah's Ark and in Biko Cholem. And I will also go maybe if there's a um, meeting in Barnet for a specific family or in Hertfordshire, wherever it is, we call it a TAC meeting, a team around the child meeting. I will go as that support to also be there as that camp simple face. And, and so that we're all, everyone is working together as a unit. And I think also with the charity, that's that's really what it, what it brought out. You know, I had the people that I'm very close with in high send such gorgeous messages and everyone's so happy for each other, as we did for the high campaign also, which I think is really lovely. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Daniela. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. Please go. Is... We, we should not need any camp simcha, anything else like that. But um, thank you also for all your support and everything. And we should meet together face to face. Mm. And happy we things. Can't, we can't wait, Daniela. But in the meantime, thank you for giving us a real focus on how to find some happiness, even in these challenging times. Um, like I said, just you being with us, I think, has brought a smile to all of our faces. But um, especially the inspiration you shared with us and the inspirational, incredible things you, that you do. Um, really, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that Camp Simcha does. And thank you just for sharing with us this evening. It's really an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Be well. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. Bye.